thank you. We are now live. Um, this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting, and it is September 1st already. Amazing. And it feels like fall, just about. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to pick up some information now about the child care issue that we've been we heard about jointly with uh, House Human Services and then also a little bit more uh, last week. So we've invited uh, both the after school program and our DCF folks in to talk about what the um, administration is recommending. So I don't, I, I think that you, you have been working collaboratively um, and I, so do you want to organize yourselves into testimony for us? Uh, Stephen, I'm looking at you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, good, good morning, Chair, good morning, Senators. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come to the hearing this morning. For the record, I'm Stephen Berbeco, Deputy Commissioner for the Child Development Division. I'm here this morning with DCF Senior Advisor, Jeffrey Pippinger, and also a member of our team, Miranda Gray, who's leading the uh, regional hubs uh, program and project for DCF. Uh, also with us this morning is Holly Morehouse, Executive Director for uh, Vermont After School. Uh, Jeffrey, would you mind uh, starting us off with an overview of the regional hubs? It would be my pleasure. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Pippinger. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner for the Vermont Department for Children and Families. Uh, thank you very much for having us in today to talk about the regional hub initiative that the department in co uh, conjunction with Vermont After School is working very hard to set up. Uh, over the past two weeks, uh, what we have done is to uh, support the creation of regional hubs around the state. Uh, that will be, uh, it's a regional model based on what is happening in supervisory unions around the state. We did that geographical flexibility is going to provide the best way to approach school age care on remote learning days as possible. Uh, those will be available via grants uh, that go out to hub sites uh, from the department through Vermont After School. The grant awards are intended to uh, cover their initial startup and operational costs. And the intent then is for these sites to become self-sufficient over time. Backing up a little bit, this is part of a three-pronged strategy that the administration has put forward in order to address the need for school age care during remote learning data, particularly in the hybrid model. The other prongs are the expansion of the number of slots for school age children by increasing the uh, ability of registered family child care homes to provide full-time care. We anticipate that that change uh, in conjunction with our current regulated system will serve an additional 3,000 children. The other, the third prong would be the expedite, uh, expediting of licensing requests and analyzing where there might be flexibility in regulations to help quickly stand up capacity. Of course, without compromising the health and safety of children. This is a public private partnership with Vermont After School. I think I, I speak for the department and the administration when I say that we are thrilled to be working with Holly and her team. They've done an extraordinary job in an incredibly short amount of time. Um, I have just been blown away. Uh, and I, I really think that having them on board with their expertise is a tremendous ab, uh, asset to the department. Our goal is to collaboratively is to create these hubs that are going to keep children safe and assist them with their uh, the engaging in online remote learning on days when they are not physically present uh, at school. Uh, many entities have come forward to help out and to uh, suggest uh, opportunities to provide uh, hub sites. Uh, those include uh, organizations that run after school programs, summer camps, other youth programming. Uh, we've also had a wide variety of businesses and other types of organizations that have offered some creative uh, uh, opportunities and solutions as well. Uh, I think we really appreciate that part of this approach means that we are uh, leveraging the community relationships that we have around the state um, 
within those communities to try and creatively address a complex situation. In developing this hub initiative, something that we have kept in the forefront of our mind is that we need to give careful consideration uh, to making sure that we are establishing a new system because essentially what we do, are doing is establishing an entirely new system of care that is layered on top of the existing system. Uh, that new system is really addressing uh, a set of challenges in a landscape that we haven't seen before, the necessity for these remote learning days. But we're really thoughtful about how do we do that without harming the existing network? How do we do that without compromising the uh, the existing system of child care, uh, which already has a lot of stresses and strains on it. So we are trying very hard to build upon those investments that we've already made in Vermont's child care system and expand to meet uh, a different set of challenges that we're seeing this fall. With that overview, I would then turn it over to my colleague Miranda uh, Gray and also to Holly Morehouse from on after school to talk through the current status and the details of what has been happening in terms of um, the day-to-day -day issues. Great, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I think I'm gonna provide an overview of where we are and where we've been and then pass over to Miranda to talk through some of the specifics of how potential hub sites move through the process. Um, so Holly, um... Before you begin, please uh, stay, introduce yourself for the record. That would be great. Thank you for that reminder. It's, good to it's great to have you here, by the way. It's, I really appreciate um, the opportunity. Uh, so for the record, my name is Holly Morehouse and I'm the executive director of Vermont After School. Um, and I did do wanna start with thanking um, Chair Lyons and the committee for taking testimony on this important initiative. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, DCF, Department for Children and Families, for stepping forward to take this on. Um, Vermont's families needed a state approach, um, and that required a state agency to step into this space and work to develop a viable solution. And we really appreciate uh, the department doing that and, and being that, that state agency to come forward. What's going well? I, I will say the partnership over the last uh, seven to 10 days uh, with Miranda and with all of the DCF partners um, has been really strong. Um, we are working closely step in step. We are in touch throughout the day and into the evening and then <laughs> starting early the next morning. Um, and I really appreciate um, having that back and forth and the chance to, to shape this project uh, together. Um, we do need to move forward quickly, but we also want to move forward thoughtfully. So having um, the chance to uh, look at different issues and talk them through as they're affecting programs in the field has been really important. I'd also like to note another, uh, the close partnership with the Department of Health um, that has been a strong partner with programs serving children and youth in person since March with this, the Child Care for Essential Workers uh, throughout the summer, summer programs, and then also um, with the reopening and with this, this hub project. Um, we couldn't step for, uh, put programs forward um, to do this important work without their support around the health and safety guidelines. Um, one of the things I think that also has helped us to move forward, uh, the parts of the project that, that um, we have seen um, make progress is really the knowledge we have of the field at Vermont After School. Um, as Jeffrey said, I mean, COVID is new to all of us, but some of these issues around inequity and in, um, inequitable access to programs for children and youth outside the school day in the summer is a problem um, that has existed for a while in our state and which we have uh, provided testimony to this committee on before and you have taken an interest in. So some aspects of this problem are familiar to us. So the fact that there are some areas of the state where schools for elementary school children are in session five days a week. Um, so they have care and, and education and, um, throughout um, the morning and into the early afternoon. And then you have a strong after school provider picking up the care from one o'clock to five o'clock. Uh, makes, you know, if you're a family or a parent in that community, you have lots of supports and resources and places for your children to be. However, we have other parts of the state um, where uh, schools are fully remote and we don't have strong after school or summer programs or child care providers in those parts of the state. So some of the challenges that we are facing now are not only the timing 
and the, and the challenges around COVID, but also that we're trying to build on top of a, a, a system that isn't um, equitable already across the state. So some of that will play into how we're making progress and, and some of the ways that we're rolling out um, the project. To date, I will say that we have had um, over 160 inquiries from interested entities coming in from all across the state um, that are looking either to set up a hub or partner with a hub or provide a location uh, for one of the hubs. Some in entities are contacting us um, because maybe they don't wanna run it themselves, but they have enrichment activities that they would like to offer around arts or drama or music. And so they wanna partner um, with an existing uh, place. Um, our team has been working through all that data and inquiries. Um, as of uh, Sunday, we had elevated uh, 12 potential hub sites to Miranda at, at DCF um, to put forward as sort of a first round. We have another 20 um, that are in progress that we hope to bring forward by the end of the week and uh, roughly another 40 or so um, that are still um, in review. And um, part of that review process really is reaching out with every single one and going back and forth and talking about their scenario and their space, um, their capacity for children, the days that they're gonna be running, how it matches with the school schedule um, and so forth. Um, the project isn't without challenges <laughs> and I look forward to skipping forward to January where we can report on this effort and, and what we accomplished. But, you know, some of the challenges that we're seeing, you know, are staffing. Um, we are working on that this week to roll out a statewide staffing campaign. How do we um, staff these new hubs without depleting or challenging the existing programs, child care and after school programs that are, are also looking for staff. Um, the timing, the timing is fast. Um, that isn't anyone's fault. It's a COVID thing and it's the way the federal dollars are uh, funding, but I just I want to name that that here. Um, and then third, I want to go back to those disparities or gaps in the ex existing landscape. Um, I do want to thank the Senate uh, earlier in the session before COVID, you did pass S-335. Um, it is in the House Education Committee, I believe at this time. Um, and I just wanna bring it up here again because this program that we're talking about today runs through the end of December. Um, S-335 would give the opportunity to establish a committee now that could be looking at this issue around after school and summer and out of school time programming um, over the next four months so that when we hit January, we already have a plan about what happens next <laughs> in place uh, rather than doing what um, tends to happen in COVID where we start working on something and wish we had started it two months ago. Um, so I just wanted to mention um, that bill as well, because it would give us a way to, as we're setting forward the hubs, we could also be looking at some of the um, broader underlying issues. So I believe I'm going to pass to Miranda for some of the specifics about potential, how potential hub sites move through the process. Thank you, Holly. For the record, I'm Miranda Gray. I'm the project manager for the, project manager for the school age child care hubs. I'm um, temporarily reassigned from the Richard Program in Economic Services. So the 12 sites that Vermont After School has elevated um, to the yes, Department of Children and Families, uh, we are now reaching out to those hub sites and talking about, talking through their budget, trying to identify if there's any areas that they perhaps um, hadn't identified that they might need. Um, for example, um, Wi-Fi, one of the requirements of, to be a hub site is that you will have a Wi-Fi connection. Um, so that way we can ensure that children are able to access their educational services provided through the school system. Um, other um, items such as rent, insurance, staffing. Um, <clears throat> then we also are going over the timing of the grant. So although the, this, um, this grant will cover the first initial month's startup costs, the grant will go through um, when children break for winter break. So around December 18th through the 23rd, perhaps, um, depending on various school schedules. Um, and that is what we are looking for reports from the hub sites, um, but there would only be money for that first month, the September costs. Um, then we are also talking with some of the providers about the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, the subsidy also known as, um, just if they're not familiar with drawing in those funds, we are writing the grant requirements so that we will be able to leverage this money into the program. Um, and then we also concurrently have licensors within the Child Development Division that are reaching out to the hub sites 
to help uh, the HUBSite directors if they need um, with zoning permits, fire safety, occupancy permits, uh, really just trying to assist in any way that they can um, to ensure that the buildings are safe and ready for children um, when they go. Um, we have another um, piece that I've been overseeing is speaking with the Agency of Education to talk about a meal that the hub sites can provide and how do we access the current programs. Um, so that is information that I have to date. Um, I'm, I'm going to excuse for uh, myself for, for turning off my video. I had went into a sneezing fit and I apologize, but I did hear everything that you said. No problem. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, is, is this a time for questions? Okay, I'll try not to sneeze. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, but if someone else wants to start. Senator Ingram. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so are, um, are these 12 um, uh, that you're starting with, are, are they not um, already providing um, um, any of these services? Um, you know, I mean, are they not, are they not already um, in the childcare business? Um, or what, can you give us some examples of what kinds of places are sort of stepping forward to apply for um, I can yep. jump in on that. Um, so we're receiving inquiries from a whole host of organizations, um, um, from long-term providers that we've known very well for 15 to 20 years um, to new businesses that are um, offering to step into the space. Uh, we have in the first round um, really been looking for those who can move quickly and have the capacity. So we have you know, gone to um, places that maybe already have a license or are in close partnership with a school or um, have those relationships in the communities and can step in. So I would say in this first batch, you're seeing more of those because they can get up to speed quicker. Um, so they are all adding um, and that nobody's offered, you know, programming on remote learning days because we haven't had those in the past um, the way that we now do. Um, a number of them are, are able to use existing spaces, but many are also looking at additional spaces. So they may be, you know, have three existing locations, but they're now expanding to offer the remote learning days, which is a full day, um, which is different for an after school program. And um, it's more like what they do in the summer. And then they may be um, looking at a fourth space to also increase capacity in their community. Um, so uh, we are trying to draw on the strength of of what already exists um, and uh, folks who have training and knowledge of how to care for children and youth um, and in places where new businesses are stepping forward, we're also finding that often they're stepping forward with a space, but maybe they don't wanna run the, the program themselves, the childcare program themselves. So they're looking for an existing partner to do that piece maybe in their space. Um, and some of those where, especially where they're looking at new spaces where they've never been care before. Some of that takes a little bit longer to go through the permitting process, um, but they're sort of in the net, next batch of review that we expect to come forward. And are, the, um, are they sort of geographically spread out um, or are we, I mean, I know one of the problems with you know, existing programs is that we haven't had, you know, been able to have them everywhere where you know, our Vermont families need them. How, how are we doing with being able to yeah, that's a great, great question because that is that's very true. So out of the first 12, um, they're in eight different counties. Um, and we did intentionally also in going through the first sort of round, try to, to rise up, you know, ones that could uh, cover different parts of the state. There are some areas that um, we uh, are concerned about and we have been doing, um, rather than waiting for people to come to us, we're doing the outreach down to those communities. Uh, to see who can come forward um, and um, step into that space. So those areas are receiving extra attention um, and participating in community meetings and pulling players together uh, to try to solve the solutions there because that would be um, where we don't already have a strong existing partner um, who's, who's you know, better able to step into the space. So 
Um, we're trying to handle both simultaneously and then also not slow down the ones that are ready to open next week if they can you know, move through the full process with DCF, so. And if I may add on to what Holly is saying, uh, it's something that's important to keep in mind in this conversation and in a, a geographic disbursement of these hubs is that they really are based on what is happening in those local communities and the supervisory unions in particular. They're, um, so for instance, in those communities around the state that have no remote learning days who are back in person five days a week, we, we won't see a hub in those communities because there's not a need at this moment in time for remote learning day care, if that makes sense. Which also brings up an entirely different set of challenges that as we are working on standing up this particular system of care, this additional system, we're trying to keep in mind that it's a really, it's a very dynamic landscape, right? There are supervisory unions and communities where there may be um, one uh, in-person day for the first several weeks, and then that's gonna flip to two days. Or there are areas where they might be in person five days a week, not need remote learning hubs. And depending on what happens with the pandemic in the fall and the winter, you know, there may we may see a need for remote learning in communities as days are taken offline. Um, so it's, it's just something to keep in mind when we're talking about the, the geography of it. And then just one last question, if I may. Um, so do these um, hubs, I mean, I, mean um, I can envision that parents would be working, you know, like a nine to five job and the, and the, the, um, the kids have to be in school part of that time, but then do they, do they continue to stay in those hubs and then are there like after school programs also offered uh, to them until they can be, you know, go back to their homes or you know, is there a segue from one to the other? The, the straight after school programs um, were not built into this model. Um, so if a school is in session five days a week, but they get out at one, there still is a child care issue from one to five for all those families. Mm -hmm. um, some communities are fortunate that an after school provider is stepping into that space and in other communities that's gonna continue to be a challenge. The hub program was set up only for remote learning days. Now, we do have some strong partners that will be running, if a school district's doing like the AB days, um, well, they'll have the, the children who are not in school in the hub, um, you know, during the, the school, regular school hours, um, and then they will expand, you know, extend all the way until five. So they'll be offering that, that full day. Um, uh, but that, um, for the kids who are not in school that day, that part of the care is covered by the HUB program. But kids who maybe were in school and then coming to the after school program afterwards, that isn't. So um, it, it, it would be great uh, to have all of that covered, maybe because it is all a child care issue and it is an equity issue. Um, but the way that this was originally conceived, um, it was only for the remote learning days. I appreciate your question very much, Senator. Okay, is that, that that's good, uh, Senator Ingram, you're all set for, for now. <laughs> okay, Senator McCormick has his hand up. Uh, you're muted, Senator. Sorry, um, you may have already uh, address this and I just didn't understand it, but uh, maybe just going over it again. To me, when, when we speak of, of a hub, that implies a hub and spokes. And it's sort of a geographical term. You know, you have a, a centralized something and then you get satellites out there. How local can we get the services? How just physically, geographically close to people can, can we get um, childcare after school services? One of the questions that we ask um, in the initial survey is which schools uh, do the, you know, does the hub expect to draw from? And many of the entities that we're looking at are very local. 
Um, there, some of them are using school buildings where there is space, um, even with the remote learning days, or they're working closely with the school for a, a building next door. Um, so we are we are really focused on that that local um, level. There are some entities that have come in that um, serve or draw either employees or um, clientele from a broader region. Um, you know, so maybe a fitness center or something like that that yeah. has people come from multiple towns, and so they're stepping forward. So when we ask them about their schools, they tend to think a little bit broader because they're thinking of sort of that catchment area. Um, the same with an employer that might be coming forward who's really looking to set up a program for their employees. Some of the hubs are also setting up um, at within schools or school districts really for the children of the teachers during the school day. So in that case, they may be pulling, their teachers may come from a lot of different towns. So the children in that particular location would come from a lot of different towns. Um, but the idea is that it's where the teachers are working. Uh, so they bring their children with them. Um, but we are trying to avoid, I think maybe what you're getting at Senator is having um, a hub that's um, you know, 30, 60 miles away from somebody yeah, yeah. thinking that they can transport their children there. Um, so I mean, we're really, yeah. Trying to get I, I may be making too much of the word hub. On this committee, we deal with hub and spokes largely with drug issues. And there it is a geographical kind of term. Okay, so so you would have, and what I'm thinking, of, so is this going to be like Rutland would be a hub and then Chittenden, Menden, Pittsford would be spokes? Or I don't see how, how it works. We will have, um, I can say that like we're looking at um, a number of different entities in Rutland that all may be hubs um, because they because of the capacity that's needed and what they can serve. The same within Chittenden County, there'll be um, potential hub sites in Burlington as well as surrounding towns. Um, so we're not expecting there just to be one giant hub in all of Chittenden County that will draw children from all over. Um, so it, I think it is different than the the other model. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to obsess on one word and get confused because so White River Junction would be a hub, but Sharon might be a hub as well. Yes, if if the need is there. Um, so if the school days are remote, and if the need is there, and if we can be successful in finding a partner and space and all those pieces there, um, there will be challenges. Like I said, and there may be parts of the state that. Um, we don't, we can't reach, um, you know, if there really isn't a partner, if there isn't a safe building. Um, and I'm really concerned, those are the areas that keep me up at night. Um, and right now, what we're trying to do is move forward everybody else as we can get them going. Um, so I think we're moving forward the first set, we're dealing with kind of the next that have some tricky issues, and then we're going to get to the, the third sort of layer, um, where we'll really have to dive in deep and call on partners to step forward and have community meetings and so forth. Um, and we're all trying to do it like yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everything. Yes, of thank course, you. right? That's the challenge. Thanks, Senator. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Cummings, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I still would like to see some kind of a map. So I have some, you know, idea we seem to be all of this is talking about who's willing to come forward and set up and i was thinking of pods not hubs um but some kind of a child care facility i'm on the other end i'm hearing from parents who don't know what they're going to do next week i've got two grandkids coming two days this week because there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, and it's still iffy on the days off, even with parents taking vacation and juggling and doing other things. I heard from a woman yesterday who's worked, you know, really hard to better herself, get an education, get a good job. She's finally got a good job and she loves it and she may have to give it up because she can't find childcare and her husband's a farmer and he's gotta be out harvesting. 
how are we letting parents know that there is childcare available? I mean, nothing's in the white pages anymore or the yellow pages. Are schools, you know, is, is there communication? Are the schools telling you which parents have trouble? Do the parents know they should tell the school? Um, how, how are we, how are we connecting the parents with the hubs, the pods, whatever we're calling them? Um, and how do we know where there's holes? Um, by next week and probably by a month ago. I am, I'm just waiting to see if um, Randa or Jeffrey wanna step in. I will say that the, the sites that we're working with um, they're moving through the grant process with DCF and the conversations with us at the same time they are working on hiring at the same time they're working on registration. So a number of them are already filling slots, even though they don't have a confirmed grant to be a hub because that's the kind of timing and that's the kind of world we live in. Um, so I would say locally they're uh, reaching out uh, to families and working with the schools to get those slots filled um, and as as we get closer and closer to the start of the school year. Um, we also, um, the state already has in place the child care uh, referral specialists, and that's where we're, uh, we continue to point families to them, and they will have all the information on the hubs as they come online to add to sort of the landscape, have those conversations. And the reason we're using that existing system for families is because that landscape is changing all the time. So, uh, you know, a family may need to know you know, who they can, you know, get to for care next week and the hub's gonna be ready the week after or something like that. So um, we're, we're trying to stay within the existing system that the, the state already has there. Um, we I, do. Now, I guess my question is, when I think of children and families, okay, that to me is connected to the state, which is connected to welfare, it's connected to low income, how do I, as a middle-class parent who has never needed childcare before because my kids have been in school five days a week and I've had somebody that stayed with them or an after-school program, how do I even know that there's a child care referral specialist? Is somebody passing out, are the schools, how do I, how do I know that? Well, the Senator Cummings. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Uh, Senator Cummings, I, I think I can answer that question. Uh, and we certainly have that concern as well. Uh, and that's why we have been uh, sending out a very clear message about the child care referral network uh, and also the child care financial assistance program through the Vermont Superintendents Association to Vermont Superintendents, and also through the Vermont Principals Association to Vermont Principals to share with families. And as well, uh, we have been meeting with employers uh, throughout the state in regional calls over the past two weeks through the regional development corporations uh, so that employers are also aware of the Child Care Referral Network and the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Uh, I, we agree with you uh, that it's very important that Vermont's families are aware of these resources uh, because as Holly said, uh, they are going to be uh, critically important for the regional hubs uh, as well as uh, the state's regulated childcare system. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, if you wanted to add to that. Well, Stephen's uh, essentially stole the words right out of my mouth. And I would also reiterate what he said about employers because we have had employer networks come to us and say, what should we do about these hubs? What should we do about childcare for our employees? So we, that's, we have been engaging them in conversations about what we're doing and reiterating the importance of those childcare referral specialists, those local childcare referral specialists, so that employers can say to their employees, you should call this number, you should talk to these referral specialists because it's not just about the hubs, it's about the continuum of childcare options which may be available and may be most appropriate for your situation as a family currently. We do have a map, Senator, 
Um, so I'm like happy to report that. Um, I don't know if that's, I could share a screen and show it now, or I could send it. Um, Just send it to the committee. I think I'm a visual learner. And when people call me, it's helpful for me to see if there's dots in Washington County or not. Um, so I can say, well, I see there's 10 dots here. So there's something, and if you call this number, um, they can help you figure out what they are. Okay, so I, if it's okay with the chair, I could send the map, know that it's a work in progress map. Oh, yeah. um, right, so it will have, it identifies the initial 12 and then it set, you know, shows the 20 that are still in progress. It doesn't yet show the 40 that are behind that. We can also make sure that you have the number for the resource referral child care specialist at your fingertips so that you can um, that would be share that. Okay. Really helpful because I could share that on things like front porch form. Sure. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. And, and, and I think the most important, well, one of the important pieces for uh, our constituents to understand is that this is for school age children. It's not every gap for childcare, right? Okay. Uh, our committee, uh, Senator Cummings, do you have other questions? No, that would be very helpful, uh, I think. Good, yes, that would be Lifeline. extremely helpful. Um, and knowing that it will change radically every single minute yeah we we get that this is what we have now and there's more coming all right right but it's, it's good to know that there's there's some boots on the ground right now senator westman you want to yeah uh, the backup to that would be the communications that you've had with the school districts and the superintendent's offices and what you're trying to accomplish any backup that you have to that to follow the map we can use to um, explain to our constituents and explain what's going on. And if you sent that to the committee, they could put it up on our website too. That would be helpful. Is that possible? We can certainly provide that. We can make sure that okay. you can get that to the committee. Yeah, I, and I think um, as, as compact of uh, information as possible would be um, use, very helpful. We'll put it up on our web page and then we'll be able to share it with folks who are going forward. So um, I do have some questions and I was, as, as you, and um, first of all, I wanna thank you, uh, each one of you for, for the work that you're doing. This is, this is not easy. This is like juggling swords. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Um, but I do have some questions and it, it really relates to the role that we may be able to play in um, facilitating some of this and that knowing that the timing is probably not great because everything has to, as Senator McCormick said, has to happen a month ago. But um, having said that, uh, let me start with the last question first, which is you mentioned, uh, Miranda mentioned, the concept of uh, paving the way through towns, zoning issues and related permitting uh, stuff. Uh, who is, is, the, is DCF taking the lead on that with individual towns, municipalities? Uh, how is that all sugaring off? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, we are using our licensors to help support. So we're really taking the lead from the hub sites. If they um, are not having any issues with accessing those permits themselves, then we're following their lead. If they need assistance, that's when we will work with our other um, state agencies to see what support we can provide. We've already had a prep meeting with the Agency of Natural Resources um, just to see what support they might be able to provide during this time um, so that it's understood that it is very quick timing. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that there may be some uh, blanket, um, uh, some way that we can offer some blanket provisions through the legislature that would ease this, uh, the process for these uh, 
hubs or pods to go into effect. That's one, but then you also mentioned that some of the places, some of the um, organizations you're looking to make more permanent. So if we were to offer something that supports uh, an organization during COVID, the COVID emergency process, that would not help for the long term. And I'm, I'm just trying to sort out how that's being balanced. But, and if there is some uh, legislative work that we could do that would, you know, be sort of the, the temporary um, zoning permit or whatever is, it, is needed. I have, I have you thought of that as a possibility? If, if I may respond, I, I think at this point in time, we haven't, we have not, to my knowledge, we have not seen a widespread systemic issues regarding zoning or things that might re require a bigger legislative fix. However, that is something that we're keeping an eye on where there might be some of those more systemic uh, obstacles that are making it harder to open hubs. Uh, but to date, I don't think we have seen anything that would require that level of attention. But we will keep you informed if we do. Okay, that's helpful. Um, then, and then the other one, I think very much related to this is you're talking about which uh, elements of licensure to relax for some of these uh, organizations or places, hubs. Um, so have you got a list? of those licensure requirements that you're looking to um, relax over a period of time? And if so, are there some that we should be looking at? I, are, or are they all going through a rule making process? Is this gonna be an emergency rule making process? How is this gonna sort itself out? Oh, Senator Lyons, um, the approach that DCF is taking is to uh, create a new exempt category within the regulated system uh, for these regional hubs. Uh, that includes requesting uh, waivers from our federal partners uh, and also uh, making uh, amendments or writing amendments for the fe our federal partners to approve to our state plan. Will there be any effect at all on the, on the state um, regulations? Uh, we're certainly going to keep an eye on that. Uh, and if there are any effects, uh, then we will certainly let the committee know. Well, the sooner the, the, sooner the better. I'm, I'm thinking that um, we disappear uh, within the next couple of weeks. So anything that has to happen should happen quickly. And I know that a lot of these places will be opened up by the time we're uh, adjourned for the session. So it's important. I think it's really important to stay connected. But thank you. Um, that's good. Um, and then, lines, may may yeah. I add on to what uh, the deputy commissioner was saying? Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I would also offer um, that in addition to those kind of bigger regulatory, you know, official um, uh, areas that we're looking at, I think part of what we're also doing. Uh, is trying to make sure that the, the actual process is fast and efficient for folks who are contacting the department regarding licensing questions or, or challenges. I think we want to prioritize this so that we can make sure that we're helping our community partners stand these sites up as quickly as possible without unnecessary red tape, while, of course, keeping in mind the safety of children, et cetera. Okay. Um, again, I think it would be very helpful for us to see exactly what is happening so we have a clear understanding of what the um, licensure requirements are. And then uh, I'm going to ask a question about the grants process in a minute. And similarly with the grants, because um, right now it's a, what we're hearing is better than we were, we, I think what we're learning is better than what we learned last week. <laughs> we're starting to become familiar with what you're doing and it is hard work and, uh, but there, if there are ways that we can help, that's really what we're looking, that's really what we're looking for. Um, 
so uh, I, I have a couple more questions. One, uh, you mentioned family center homes. Um, I think Gregory Pippincher mentioned that. Is this, is the, um, are the changes there more than the four hours, the four hour change that we're looking for legislatively or are there other things that you're looking for in terms of allowing the family centered homes to participate more? Um, uh, thank you, Senator Lyons. I, I, I believe that the uh, bill, uh, as most recently drafted, would cover the, the needs that we've identified. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, and then you, you mentioned that the, af the grants would flow through the after school program. So, and so that begins to uh, raise questions for me about uh, what the criteria are within the grant and you have mentioned some of those uh, a bit but and then you've also indicated that you'd like to see this move move as smoothly and as quickly as possible and some of the grants that I've uh, that I'm hearing about not in DCF but in other um, other parts of the agency have been extremely difficult and complex for people uh, so how can you just talk a little bit about what are, what's the bottom line for, uh, for the grant criteria? What exactly is in there and uh, how do we both ensure the safety of, both, of kids as well then as um, some efficiencies? Will it be possible for us to look at the grant application itself and the information that's required? So if I may, um, I will clarify that the grants will actually be issued out through the um, Child Development Division. They won't go through Vermont After School. So Vermont After School has elevated those that they feel would be a good hub site partner. Um, and then the Child Development Division would be deciding, making the final decision. Um, so the requirements um, are numerous. I will say just because the um, CCDF and You'll have to excuse me, I haven't learned all of the acronyms of this new division yet. Um, so it's um, perhaps uh, Deputy Commissioner. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do apologize, so I can find that out for you. Um, but so there are numerous, and it's really around the safety, making sure that the um, staff at these sites will have the education that they need, um, that background checks, which we are also hoping to help people expedite. Um, have happened. Um, Vermont After School will provide trainings once we've kind of let the dust settle a little bit starting in mid-September for the staff members. Um, the mandated reporter training is already something that staff can um, access online at their leisure. Um, so there, there are a number of requirements, but I think what I'm talking about when I'm talking to the hub managers is that we're here to be a good partner um, because this is new to a lot of um, the providers that haven't worked within the regulated system. Um, so, and I, once again, I'm like, I apologize because there are, I think, several pages worth, so I can't give you great detail to what those are, but it really is around ensuring the safety um, of the children, which I think that's what, when we're looking to, um, to make the process as quick as we can. Um, so I'm hoping within the next, you know, by early next week that we would have some grants. There's not actually a grant application. So this process has been a little bit different for the providers. Um, it has been that you have provided information to Vermont after school. We've paired that with the school district. Um, and then this makes sense because there's a need and we have a provider who can um, meet that need. Um, so it, it is a little bit different. There will just be the grant that comes out of this, not a grant application. If I can add on to that, so it it is a different process than where most of um, our organizations are used to having like a competitive grant process announced and there's an application and you fill out the application and there's a deadline and you move through that process. This is a little bit different um, in that we're taking all the inquiries, so those 160 inquiries, and we're working our way through them. What we're looking for is geography, so where they're located and what the school schedules are and how that matches. Um, and the need in those areas. We're looking at the capacity of the organization, how many children do they think they can serve? Um, and we're you know, elevating ones that can serve larger numbers first, and then, then we'll do another round um, to where there's additional need. 
the readiness of the organization. So, you know, like if it's a, a licensed child care center already, if it's a youth serving organization, if it's a parks and rec department or an after school program that um, it already works in the space, um, if they already have space secured that they know that's going to work, um, or they have that in progress. So readiness is a piece. And then kind of the complexity. There's some areas of the state where a lot of players are coming forward and we're trying to figure out, do they join together and it's one hub with different spokes to use Senator McCormick's thing or different mini hubs within it, or are they all separate and they just operate completely separately? So with every one, we're not, um, we're not really weeding anybody out uh, based on criteria. We're working through every scenario and trying to come up with the best scenario. Now, some people are dropping out during that process because they get into it um, and they're like, no, actually we don't want it. Or like I said, they came forward and it turns out they wanna offer space, but they don't actually wanna offer the program themselves. So then we're trying to see if there's a partner uh, that we can partner with them with. Often their plans are also changing as we move through these conversations. So we have, they submit one thing and saying they can serve 50 kids. And then when we get on the phone with them and we're talking about the funding and the need in their community, they start to think, oh, but if I added this site, then I could serve a hundred children. Um, and so there, we call them profiles of what they are able to do develops and changes over time. And once we get them through where they feel steady enough and um, we think they're ready, then we hand them on to Miranda um, and she takes it to that next stage where they're working with a licensor and confirming the space and the safety. And then we go back to the pile and start pulling up the next, that, the next sort of group. Um, so. I, that's that's kind of how this process is is working right now and so in the process you're looking at things like uh air circulation so the kids are kept healthy similar to the way that schools are have you know improved their hvac hvac systems um are you thinking about huh there's so much to think about um and you said you were working closely with the Department of Health. So all of the Department of Health guidelines are in place. Uh, yes, they just updated the guidelines yesterday um, yes. for childcare and out of school time care to capture mm -hmm. these hubs and these remote learning days. And we have a state call tomorrow uh, that Miranda's gonna be on as well as Dr. Brina Holmes. Um, to answer any questions for the potential hubs about the healthcare guidelines and how to run programs and so forth. If I might okay. um, in for a moment. Go ahead. Go ahead, Miranda. Sorry. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to offer that when the grant is finalized, which we hope will be within the next few days, I would be happy to share that um, with the committee. The hub Excellent. Grant. Yeah, that's good. It's a, a, there are a lot of moving parts and one of them is the grant and the other is all the places that are coming in. So it's, it's, it's tough. Um, you're, you're doing an amazing amount of work in a short period of time. Um, I do have another question and this is related to funding, funding uh, parity for these after school programs as compared with those that are currently in place. So these are new and then the, the reimbursement or the payment rate for folks who are participating in these new programs. I know I've had questions uh, from uh, childcare providers that, oh, the, you know, the, the new programs are going to be uh, receiving, the, the workers will be receiving more money than what we currently receive. Are you seeing, how is that being, um, that's one question. The other question I'm going to ask about is um, how parents, are, the CCFAP and how parents are being uh, evaluated. So there we go. Uh, I'll just throw those two areas out for you to comment on. So I can speak to the um, subsidy first, if that would be all right. Um, our child care referral specialists are well versed. So not only are we trying to direct um, parents there to learn what existing child care options there are, where the hub sites will be, but they also are able to connect um, families to see if they're financially eligible for the subsidy support. So we're hoping by directing families there as much as we can that they will be able to have all of their needs met um, in one way. <clears throat> Um, and then in terms of the budgets that we've seen, 
Um, it does vary a bit. We have um, some of the first 12 that what comes to mind is that there's um, some in-kind staff. So the school systems have been able to offer um, some staff that will be able to go and assist in the hubs. Um, so that has certainly reduced the cost. And I think it, um, it is, it's what is the cost of the program is what will ultimately de decide what the cost, the expenses to parents. Um, so it does range a bit. Um, I think a lot of the um, providers that we're looking to utilize are also used to running free programs if possible. So um, I think that they're trying to also look and see what other partnerships do they have with schools um, or other entities to be able to make this as affordable as they can for parents. Holly, is there anything that I missed there? Yeah, I just want to back you up on the, the staffing issue. Um, Senator Lyons, uh, staffing is a challenge, right? In early child care programs, after school programs in schools right now. So uh, this week we are, um, you know, hoping to roll out a, a statewide campaign that really promotes um, the value of working with children and youth and, and looking at these spaces um, and how to move more people into the field rather than poach staff from existing programs that then move over. Because if we do that, all we've done is we've shifted staff around. We haven't actually solved a capacity problem. And when we first met, I think the very first meeting we had with Vermont After School and um, Let's Grow Kids was there and um, DCF, um, we very, you know, all of us very like clearly agreed that what we're trying to do is set up a system that meets the current need, but does not harm in any way the existing system that's there and actually um, results in a stronger uh, landscape going forward across the board for childcare all the way from zero, um, you know, through, I will say through 18, but in this case, you know, through, uh, through 10, um, through sixth grade, 10 to 12 year olds. So um, we are taking a lot of care um, with how that, that rolls out. Uh, the programs themselves, when they uh, submit their budgets, there, um, as Amanda described, there, there's a lot of variety um, be, depending on who their fiscal agent is um, and how they're set up. Um, they are also very conscious of, so a number of them already run existing programs, so they also don't want to just shift staff from one place to another. Um, when we get deeper um, into those areas where there are not enough programs yet and not enough existing staff, I think that will be interesting to look at and maybe we you know, can come back and talk further about what did we have to do in those areas um, where there weren't existing partners coming forward, where we, we couldn't build off an existing infrastructure. What did we have to do there, you know, to make it work? Because I think it will look different than what we're doing this week on the on the, the first initial set that are coming forward. Um, so I don't have a simple answer, but I do know that we are all in agreement that we're not, um, we don't want to challenge the existing system. Um, there is an added challenge, I will say, with many of these providers, the school age care providers, um, they were not part of the stabilization funds that happened earlier on in, in March and so forth that, that was for early childhood. They weren't, um, that didn't happen for the school age for the after school providers. So many of them did have to furlough or let staff go. So there is also that added hump that some of them are facing of how to ramp up um, and um, fill in those staff positions in line with the school year. So. It's a, it's, to me, that is the sticky, the stickiest problem, I think, within the whole project and one that we really um, are trying to put a, a good attention to. All right. I'd go like ahead. to just Thank emphasize, yeah, go ahead. if I may, I'd just like to emphasize a point that Holly made regarding um, if we do this, if we do this right, and if we do it well, we're going to end up strengthening the system in the long run, right? by the focus that we're putting on this right now, the resources that we're putting on it, and the attention that it's all getting. Um, along with that, I think whether this is helpful or not remains to be seen, but I think one way of looking at this is that with any luck, right, if we're fortunate, this is a temporary initiative, right? There were the, the during, during the pandemic, when we have a need for remote learning days, at some point in the future, there may be a, hopefully a time when we don't need remote learning days anymore. But so, so when we think about that as a temporary piece, depending on what the definition of temporary is, I mean, it could be months, it could be much longer than that, but 
I think we're really looking at this as a surge, right? This is a surge effort in terms of resources and staffings to meet this challenge. But again, if we can do it right, it'll help us on the other side of this. Yeah, I, I do back that it's a surge effort, um, but I also, that how we become stronger because it's a surge effort until the next school vacation week. And then there's working families with no care for that week or until the 10 weeks of next summer. Um, you know, so it is a surge right now in remote learning days, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can be clever and intentional um, so that we don't, families don't face it again. Like, like a, you know, that underlying problem has always been there. Um, this gives us a chance to address it in this surge capacity, um, but hopefully we learn lessons from that that carry forward. Um, and then once again, I just will bring up S335 as a way to get a group up and planning now for what happens after the surge effort. Um, you know, S335 uh, three, right, 335 creates, you know, the task force to look at this issue specifically. Um, and if there's a way to get it through before you all adjourn, um, we could actually have a group over the next four months thinking about what happens after the surge and after this initiative ends um, so that we are in a stronger place. Okay, that um, you you did mention that early on, but uh, that it's good to reinforce that I think for all of us. Um, I, my last question for now is um, related to uh, content, and I you know the the work that after school has done has been very significant in our prevention efforts, and I'm wondering how you're evaluating the program content that's coming to you. I think the first step with content uh, relates to the training uh, uh, schedule, the staff training that, that Miranda started to outline. There, there are the required trainings around mandated reporting and so forth, but we also have put together um, a series of um, six plus different workshops that will all be available free online, uh, virtually for um, staff and all of the hubs that uh, focus on social emotional learning, trauma-informed practice, uh, uh, youth mental health um, and, and first aid, uh, child development, um, to make sure that um, the only way to have the youth outcomes is to have the quality programming. And I think that's what you're getting at. Um, so it's not just about the space and the staff being there. It's actually, what are you doing with the children and, and, and uh, what, what types of activities um, and how you're supporting really um, you know, we are all dealing with trauma right now, right? And we're dealing with a lot of uncertainties. And so it's it's really important to us that when staff move into these hubs and these hubs open up, as well as our regular after school programs and youth serving organizations, everybody's ready um, to interact with children and families and understand um, how to do that when they've been under the, the stresses in front of them. We've also um, held uh, a statewide forum uh, two weeks ago uh, with Auburn Water Song um, that was on vicarious trauma and burnout. And we had uh, folks from all across the state and all kinds of youth serving organizations participate in that. And, um, and we will have uh, a number of high profile speakers uh, that we, we're not doing our regular conference this year. Um, we're doing um, a series of high profile speakers throughout the year that will all be coming in and talking about diversity and um, and supporting children and youth. So we hope that the hubs will be part of that, that training series as well. Um, and then as far as their base programming, uh, we do have experts on staff uh, to work with them if they are not already um, an experienced uh, school age care, child care provider on what a schedule would look like, what kind of activities, um, how to support. Um, we're not replacing the education, the education day um, and responsibility sits firmly with the schools um, and the school system, but how do we support learning and making sure that the, the activities in the hubs are engaging and have kids thinking and problem solving and, um, you know, and, and working with their hands and moving and all those kinds of pieces. So uh, we will be following up as they come online and as they solidify their plans, uh, both on the training and on the programming in the sites. And um, I guess, important to us is that this is all becomes standardized so that as the program as you said it 
we're building a program for the future in many ways. And I know how that after school already has done a lot of this. So it'd be, it would be great to maintain the partnerships that you have with AOE and DCF and DOH so that this can build uh, for the future. Um, okay, I think Senator McCormick has has his hand up, and I know he's. Uh, are you there, Senator? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, yeah, good. I, I, All right, you've yes, had your uh, hand up for a while. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, thanks. Well, you, I had already spoken once, so second time up. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I'm hearing correctly. Other than S three thirty five, I have not heard an ask. Are you? You're saying this is there? You're reporting to us on what you're able to do within your administrative discretion under existing law, or are you asking for legislation as well? Uh, Senator McCormick, thank you for that yes. question. Uh, uh, we, we are not asking for additional legislation at this time. Thank okay, you. I should take this as a report. And the other question I have is, is uh, a lot of this need is, is COVID related. How much COVID money do you have can you use for this? Uh, Jeffrey, would you mind giving a, or would you kindly give a quick summary of sure. our- Sure, it's, it's approximately $12 million in CRF. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Right, so this is the, yeah, thank you, Senator, for reminding us about the $12 million because that, uh, what, uh, uh, started this off really was the request at Joint Fiscal Committee for $12 million. And then uh, an understanding that the policy committees, both the House Human Services and our committee will review the programs and look to see if there's any guidance that we would like to provide for the distribution of the funds that we're talking about. Um, there is one bill in the House uh, that, that relates to the family-centered homes to extend the number of hours that those uh, folks can serve kids, uh, school-age kids. So that, that bill will, is being developed as we speak in House Human Services. And we may see additional uh, information, you know, additional legislation in that bill or related legislation that we will uh, take up when it gets to us. And that should get to us pretty quickly because this is, uh, this is uh, an emergency in many ways. Senator Ingram, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, Holly, did you say S-335 is in house education now? Yes, that's my understanding. Um, yeah, I don't know what we can do. Um, well. well, so so uh, I've already written that down, and we'll we'll see where it is and what's happening, and I'll, I'll talk with the chair. Uh, it's I don't know that it was listed as a priority piece of legislation mm -hmm. by the House, but you can check with the chair of education, and I will as well as to whether or not it was listed. Yes, I know I it's do. a it is an important bill. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right, committee, any other questions uh, for Deputy Commissioner Berbeco or Jeffrey Pippinger or Miranda Gray or Holly Morehouse? Uh, we're, we're beginning to get uh, an understanding of the, uh, I wasn't gonna call it chaos, but there's a lot going on that you are juggling and we greatly appreciate that. It, it it sounds difficult and it is difficult. I, I think it all, it all flows down to the questions that Senator Cummings was asking about the individual family and how they know uh, when and where they can access the care that they need for their kids uh, who are now in hybrid learning. It, it, is, it is a COVID issue. So um, I think we cer certainly can support the use of COVID funds for this. Our concern is it, that it's done correctly, adequately and equitably, and that our kids are kept uh, safe in the process. So I uh, appreciate all the work that you're doing. 
any other comments that anyone would like to make before we um, finish our work? All right, sounds good. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Holly, that you won't be having your annual meeting, but it sounds like you're going to be doing some great things other otherwise. Yes. And I'm going to wear. I will wear my cape the next time that we're together. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I will. We appreciate your support and um, appreciate the silver lining that you pointed out about the close partnerships with the state agencies. Um, it's really very important. Yep. Thank you very much for this time. Okay, um, committee, um, I have one other thing to talk about with you, but Senator McCormick, you have your hand up. So why don't you, no? Okay, it, it just hasn't, you Sorry. haven't lowered. Hasn't That's there. okay. Um, is there, um, are there any other comments on this? Okay, I, I wanna switch over. Uh, I see that Senator Westman has not, it's not here, nuts. Okay, I just wanted to talk briefly about S-252 before we signed off, but um, I don't feel it necessary to do that right now. So we'll do that tomorrow when we're back together at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So in the tradition of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, we are finishing early and uh, not because we're neglecting our duties, but because that's just the way we work. Uh, thanks all again. And uh, we'll, we'll end the meeting today and we'll come back tomorrow morning, unless someone has something else. Okay, thank you all. Thank Nellie, you. We, can, um, we can leave, take care. Thank you, Chair, thank you, committee.